Welcome to week two of Growing in God's Word. I hope you're enjoying this as much as I am. And my wife and I are having so much time. Last week we talked about pondering it and let the Word of God ponder and kind of pond up in our life and meditate. This week we want to talk about a devotional Bible study method called See It. Now in this series we want to grow together in our grasp of God's Word. You know, we're teaching in this series the devotional method of having quiet time. And I hear so many people say, Mark, I don't have time. And so many people say, Mark, I, I don't know if I can make time. Everyone has 168 hours in a week. We all have the same amount of time. We don't have time for everything. However, I do believe we make time for those things most important to us. If it's important for us, we make time. So I don't think it's a matter of not having time. I think it's a matter of prioritizing or making something a priority, making time for it. The Bible says in Matthew, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. It's Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. We find time, we prioritize. How many of you find time to eat? Don't raise your hand. I think all of us do. In fact, some of us make time. Some of us look forward to the next meal. We plan it out. We, and I want to, I think there's a challenge when we say we don't have time, um, but yet we prioritize, we all, we all have time to eat at some point or we get hungry enough. And I think in America, we have a challenge when it comes to growing spiritually with the Bible. I think, and I forget where I heard this years ago, I heard someone talk about the fact we have anorexic believers and bulimic believers. Anorexic believers are believers who have an aversion to food, and the Word of God is the living bread for us. And then we have bulimic believers, people who overeat and then they purge. And the Bible says, give me this day my daily bread. And so I want to really quick just share five rules for biblical nutrition. How, how do we make sure we're not anorexic and bulimic? Number one, eat enough. Number two, eat a balanced meal. Number three, savor your food. Number four, avoid constant diet of junk food. And number five, eat routinely. See, last week we talked about craving pure spiritual milk. Study in scripture is a means to growing spiritually daily. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 13, it says, Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with a teaching about righteousness, but solid food. Is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. It says by constant use. We call this a quiet time. See, don't be an anorexic or a bulimic. Don't just you know go to conferences and get all your word and all the podcasts and all that and 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 eat 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 and then walk out and don't do what it says. Or don't be anorexic where you push the plate away. You put the word of God. Friends, by constant use, we call that a quiet time. I'm going to talk about how to have a quiet time today and, and for, for pri privileges, I should say, of a quiet time. Number one, a quiet, the privilege of a quiet time is we give devotion to God. God deserves our devotion. And, and, and God desires our devotion. Not only does he deserve, he desires. God wants to have intimacy with us. He says in Revelation, here I am, I stand at the door and I, I knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and I will eat with him and he with me. God wants to feed us. God wants to give us food to eat. And I think the, the, the second privilege of a quiet time is we get direction from God. Not only do, 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 do we devote to God, but, but we get direction from God. I love what David said. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth. Teach me. For you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. He was saying, God, teach me. Speak to me. I love what Solomon says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, 
but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. See, what would happen if we looked at our daily devotions as, God, I want some daily direction. God, I need you to speak to me. I, I, I want the God of the universe, the creator of the world, to speak to me and give me direction. The steps of righteous people order to God. The third privilege of a quiet time is we gain delight in God. David said in Psalms 16, verse 11, you fill me with joy in your presence. Uh, David, uh, Paul in First Philippians chapter 3 says, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I, I, he, he loved to have that intimacy and delight in Jesus. Do you delight in him? See, something happens when we realize that it's not the Bible we're getting to know. We're getting to know the God of the Bible. In fact, I, I've often said this, you only know God to the degree that you know his word. And, and so we need to know his word. And, and the fourth uh, benefit of devotions is we gain, we grow more like God. We grow more like God. The purpose of this is not just, again, doctrine. We talked about this last week. It's not just reproof, not just instruction. It's so that we become more like Jesus. We can grow in our righteousness. Now, I want to talk for a few moments on key ingredients of a quiet time. I think we should start with a proper attitude. And we start with the right attitude. The Lord does not look, the Bible says, at the things that man looks at. Man looks on the outward appearance, what we wear, what we look like, but God looks at the heart. And so we need to come with expectancy, but I also think we need to come with reverence and to come with alertness and to come with a willingness to obey. The second thing about a quiet time is we carve time out. The best time for a quiet time is when you're at your best. The best time for a quiet time is when you're at your best. Here's a few suggestions. When you're spiritually alert, when you're not interrupted. Um, I don't know what you are like. I, I've actually gone back to reading my Bible uh, on my tree Bible and not my e-Bible. I have my iPad there to take notes, but I read with this because I don't get alerts. I don't get text messages. So I shut off, my, I shut off all notifications and, 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 and I bring a sticky note. And the sticky note is when I write down all the things I think about when I'm reading my Bible that I should be doing right now. And I thank the devil every time for reminding me of everything I should be doing later on as I'm doing what I really should be doing. Um, and so, you, you know, so I, 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 I do it when I'm physically alert. I do it when I can't be interrupted. And I bring a note with me to write notes down uh, so I can remember the things that later on I need to do. Um. If you've, if you've not been doing it, let me, let me just give you a suggestion. Just give him five minutes. Just give him five minutes. I think the goal should be more, maybe 15, 20 minutes a day. You could read four or five chapters in the Bible in 15 minutes a day. But if you're not doing anything right now, just give him five minutes. Get into a routine. Get into a rhythm. Um, I, I have something that, that, that is, read your Bible before breakfast. BBB, Bible before breakfast. In other words, I'm going to feed my spirit before I feed my flesh. Um, I, I also want to say the third thing for a good quiet time is find a quiet place. I love what it says in Luke 22. It says, Jesus went out as usual. So it's normal for him to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. He went out as usual. He had a regular time and a regular place. And I think it needs to be excluded. You need to find a place where you can pray aloud without distractions. And this place can become a special place, a place that God speaks to you. I think we all need that place. It could be in your house. It could be in your, in your garage. It could be in an attic. I don't know where it is for you. But it's the best special place. And fourthly, follow a simple plan. And, and here's a couple simple things. Uh, how to have a quiet time. Number one, wait on God. Number two, pray briefly. David said, search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there be any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. 
He was saying, search me, God, know my hearts. So part of devotions is, Lord, I'm not just going to read my Bible and check it off my list. God, would you speak to me today through your word? I love what David also said in Psalms, open my eyes that I might see wonderful things in your law. Psalms 119, verse 18. Prayer brings us in tune with God. And then thirdly, read a section of scripture. Read it slowly. It's not how many times you get through the book that's important. It's how much of this book gets in you. It's not how many times I read. It's how much of it gets in me. And then fourthly, we need to meditate, ponder, and memorize. Write it down. Memorize the verse. And we'll talk about that later on. Write it down in your own words. Write in a way that remi- you can remember what it says because you, you, you translated it into your language. And number five, write down something God has shown you. And then after he shows you something, take some time and have a time of prayer. See, and this is the part uh, that becomes a conversation. God, help me work on this. God, help me do what you spoke to me about. See, if it's big enough to worry about and think about, it's big enough to pray about. Paul Peter said, give me all your worries. Give, give all your worries and your cares to God, for he cares for you. Now, I want to pivot right now, and I want to talk about another method of Bible study called imagine it. This method works best when you read a narrative story, a narrative passage or a story. And, and the idea here, or a parable, the idea here is that you picture this, 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 uh, you picture this. Uh, uh, it could be, um, it, it, you, you see yourself in the story. Let's take, let's, let's take a story. Let, let's take the story of the guard in the end of the gospel where Jesus is being arrested the guard of Gethsemane. If you pictured this, could you picture you being Peter, who just earlier said, God, I will, I will die for you, Lord. And when this guy comes to arrest Jesus, Peter pulls out his sword. Could you imagine? And, and then being rebuked by Jesus as he puts the ear back on the guy? Or why don't you try going, if I was the guard, what would we feel like to be doing my job, getting paid minimum wage, perhaps, pulling garden duty, my ear gets cut off, what, is it, what would it feel like to have a loving person named Jesus pick your ear back off and heal it? Or maybe you're just the person in the crowd watching it and you go, I saw the anger of a disciple. I saw the love of a Savior and a Messiah. And I saw the healing of my friend. Or maybe the one with the issue of blood. Are you the crowd? Are you the woman? Are you, are, 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 are you Jesus? What do you feel? Mark chapter 5, the demon-possessed man. Are you the hired man whose pigs now just went and drowned it? The 2,000 pigs ran over the cliffs and drowned? Or are you the man with a legion of demons who now sits in his right mind because you're fully healed? Or are you the owners of the pig who begged Jesus to leave? See, when you picture yourself or you imagine yourself in the scripture, you ask yourself the question, how would I feel if I were involved in this situation? What would I have said? What would I have done? Then you see yourself as a different character in the story and ask yourself the same questions again. See, you take a few minutes and then you write down your thoughts and your observations and your questions and any steps you might need to take. And and then scripture comes alive as you, you imagine it in a whole new way. You ask yourself, with whom in the story do I identify most clearly? How does the situation situation resonate with my life right now? What is God trying to say to me? What does he want me to do? Now, that's the imaginant method. And I want to encourage some of you. Some of you have this imagination that runs wild, and you've never leveraged it for your devotional life. You've never leveraged it to say, oh, man, I could see myself in that. And so in a moment you're going to have a chance in your group to do that. And, and, uh, and then this week, there's, there's some digging deeper uh, 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 scriptures for you to go through and begin to look at and imagine and think and um, what stands out to you. But I want to pray over you before you go into your small group right now. Would you bow your heads right now? Lord, thank you for my friends. 
And I thank you for your word. It's living. It's active. It changes our hearts and our lives. It studies us as much as we study it. God, I pray that we would move past the milk of the word to solid food and we would grow and we would learn. I pray that in the groups today, as they, as they imagine these stories and these parables and these narratives, that the book would be like a pop-up storybook. The Bible would come alive. We would see ourselves in the story. We'd see the grace of our Savior, the love of our Master. I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. We're now going to go to our groups and our small group leaders will lead us. But church, I want to remind you, God loves you. I love you. And there's nothing you can do about it. Have a great day.